I am thrilled, I am delighted, not to mention tickle silly, to bring to you this speaker today. He's a wicked smart dude, because he went to Brown University, one of them ivory schools, and he took up engineering and physics. I don't know how they work together, but evidently he does. Um, and then, after he got out of school, he went green. All right, so that he has been involved in the citizens' climate lobby, among other things. He got a whole list of stuff that he's done and he's got awards for. Portland Press Herald gave him an award, 2021, and it read as a source award, as opposed to the Top Chef's sauce award. <laughs> and uh, he has uh, also been a teacher. Uh, he do. Uh, Parlez-vous Francais, so Pauline can engage him in conversation later on. Um, and so without any further ado, I would like you to join me in welcoming, what the hell is his name? Peter Vilgus. Uh, um, <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. That was hilarious. Um, I didn't know I was going to have a little bit of a bio after this. I would have uh, changed it. <laughs> um, so thanks very much. I should, what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of a heavy subject, but I think it's. I want to make sure that you're also aware that there's um, there's lots of hope. We um, even though let's see, it's funny enough. It's not looking earlier when I put this up. It was showing me what I see on my screen here, but I don't see that any longer. But there's hope. As he explained it to me, he's the one in the cradle. Yes, that's me. Um, so, do you know how to how, exactly this get on closet? I'll talk a little bit about. So, what I do is I'm a volunteer with a group called Citizens Climate Lobby. There are over 200,000 of us uh, across the country. There's over 2,000 in Maine. Um, and our roots actually are based in the Rotary Club. Our, the founder, who 15, almost 20 years ago now, is a fellow by the name of Marshall Saunders, who's from Southern California. And uh, I shouldn't have left to go to sleep. Yeah. That's probably what happened. Yeah. Do you want to try unplugging and plugging it back in? That might just go. Probably ought to do that. Yeah. We'll see so, I'm sorry. Anyways, so um, he was a, made a ton of money on real estate in Southern California in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and wanted to give back as a good Rotarian um, and had um, been studying about microfinance and was putting micro, if you're familiar with the concept of microfinance, he had. Um, been giving a, uh, a certain amount of money to um, poor parts of the world to have them develop their uh, their infrastructure, basically industry, to help people pull themselves out of poverty. But he was finding that uh, this particularly was one experience where he gave a ton of money to some folks who were doing uh, tapestry work in. Um, you want to get that? Yeah. Uh, tapestry work in Bangladesh, and yet the. Uh, it, in that part of the world, the oceans were were rising, and and uh, and the, the soil was disintegrating. And those, his big investment of all this uh, m machinery fell into the ocean. So he quickly changed his attention towards climate because he was studying more and more on it and realizing uh, the threat that it that it was uh, it, that the eminent threat that it was created. So what? Um, oh, you are doing master work over here. I don't well, know what's going on. Well, I'll just talk a little bit about furthermore. So what I was hoping to show is there's a model that is free to use. It's not a touch screen, so you're going to have to it's use not. this. It's not. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've tried that. Right. Now let's try it again. Oop, no touch. There you go. Forget that. Get out the gavel and hit yeah, it. Ten. <laughs> ten. Nope. Mm -hmm. Let me try rebooting it and see if that works. Yeah. yeah, that will probably do it. All right, keep hanging out with me. I'm going to try to talk and do this at the same time. This is, this is tricky. All right, so anyhow, if the, the idea, and I'll explain this in a second, and we're actually, even though we're a tiny state um, with a small population, we uh, are actually the state with probably the most capacity to do something just effective and equitable about this. That actually fits according, you know, from... Um, uh, Marshall Saunders, the founder's designs, is 
kind of is uh, fits the fourfold uh, the, the four way test for for rotary. Um, I'm just going to restart this. Let's see how this works. Uh, so basically, here's the idea is this: um, we have, a, and we're actually kind of a pivotal moment um, since the last time Dennis and I met uh, on Zoom. Um, they've been ga we've been gathering endorsements for an idea of how to most effectively and equitably speed up the transition, which is kind of starting in nips and starts towards uh, a, a future where we're not emitting carbon into the atmosphere. I, what, what I wanted to start with was this model that's created by MIT that's free to use. You can go home and take, take a look at it. Uh, let's see. Let's see if this works. There I am. So this is getting awfully personal with my baby pictures up here. I didn't mean to. I was joking with, with Dennis that my older brothers and sisters there staring at me, deciding which one's going to put the, um, the pillow over my face. <laughs> Guest. Well, that's a drag. I'm still not seeing it. Hmm. Anyways. Um, One more shot. Give me just a second. <coughs> no, it's just not receiving. It's indicating the computer is not connected. I don't know. Okay, well, I'm, my screen's right up here. Perhaps if you'd like to see it, I can show it to you after the end of this. But let me explain a little bit with just verbally what's going on. There is a number of different policies that have been tried over the time. We've known about the um, we've known about the problems of climate change for a while, uh, and there's growing scientific consensus that it's anthropogenic, meaning it's caused from from humankind. And the thing I was going to show you here with this model was actually showing all the different means we could do to do something about this. Because as we know right now, it's the poor of the world that are kind of taking it most on the chin. Um, and there's a number of different things that have tried. And one of the things you know, we've gone from, we remember regulation from the 70s. We remember government policies that would encourage ca uh, cap and trade is putting an artificial cap on how much emissions we have and having businesses that do a lot of emitting of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere trade those assets and try to drive that market down. And we also have other means which uh, carbon, like plain old carbon tax. But the policy that we could, we are actually pushing for uh, is something that uh, this Marshall Saunders from Ro the Rotary Club in Southern California came up with, which is called uh, carbon fee and dividend. The idea is this. There's basically three pa ideas to the policy. Number one, you put a gradually increasing price on the carbon, and it goes upstream as much as possible. So that's at the oil refinery, the fracking site, the coal mine, or the port of entry. That money, if it was just going to come in, if you were just going to be charging that, those companies would, would then pass on those additional costs to their consumers, which goes, so it just makes everything more expensive for the person who's buying it down, but they will absorb a little bit of that additional cost. The, um, the, uh, but the second part of that is that we're actually taking all of those proceeds and returning it as a, all of it, net revenue is returned as a 100% as a monthly dividend check for every man, woman, and child. Actually, under 18, you get a half, uh, a, a half a credit. So if you have two kids, that's like another check to your house. Um, this is something that's similar that's been working in Canada as a default policy since it started in British Columbia in 2007 and has been working kind of successfully both in bringing down their emissions but also growing their economy because that money coming back into people's pockets, no one's getting rich off of this, but it's helping assist them in a direction that allows them the latitude to be able to change some of their lifestyle choices or reinvest that or just have the ability to pay the guy to fix the deck or whatever they, they, their projects are looking to be. The, um, I think the, 
the third part is also important, which is so we have the gradually increasing price on carbon, and then giving that money that's charged at the polluters, and they will in turn, you know, uh, carry those burdens onto us. So in, may, in order for people to transition well with this and be able to not be heavily burdened, give that money back as an equal dividend check. The third part is the border adjustment fee. Now, um, the United States is one of two developed countries in the world. There's, according to the World Bank, there are 44 uh, developed countries in the world. The United States and Australia are the only two that do not yet price carbon. Um, and Australia, it looks like they're on the brink of doing so. It looks like the United States may be on the brink of doing so as well. And we're in a politically interesting situation because um, there's bipartisan support for this. This is actually an idea that came out from if you remember George Schultz and Jim Baker, Jim Baker was the Secretary of State, I believe, under the first George Bush presidency. George Schultz, I think, was the Chief of Staff under Ronald Reagan. Those are the first folks to think of this idea of how to take this economic externality of carbon emissions and bring it into the system. Our own senators, Senator King and Collins, are also um, worked significantly towards this. Uh, Twelve years ago, uh, when it looked like the United States was going to on the brink of uh, starting a cap-and-trade policy, Senator Collins proposed, was worried about how that might affect low-income folks, and she was right about that. She was ahead of this of the curve on this. So instead of having a cap, the artificial cap, instead of which is what we're talking about these days, is a is a price that goes up. That that uh, that cap on um, in returning the money. She she was talking about making sure it was a dividend that was system that was returned to each and every uh, man, woman, child, just like we're talking about now. So we actually have some significant support from it uh, from Collins, although she um, she didn't get the support from some, kind of the entrenched environmental groups at the time because it was relying on markets, and I think that they just thought that the legislature it was going to go in the direction of. A, um, uh, of a cap and trade, which is what everybody was going going for at that time. But the nice thing to know is that Maine, even though we only have, what do we have, 1.4 million people at this point in the state, roughly, we also have, if you were to actually do the calculations on how much carbon dioxide, which is the prime driver of climate change, that Maine contributes, Maine contributes 0.32% of U.S. carbon emissions. Tiny little fraction. So. It seems like we're kind of powerless. Even you know, Governor Mills has got this ambitious goal of getting us carbon neutral by what is it, 2040? But if she could flip a switch tomorrow and make us carbon neutral, it still doesn't mean that lobster is going to stay in, in you know uh, Casco Bay or anything. Um, I remember when my 11-year-old daughter was young, we used to get Maine shrimp. Get it on my my mother-in-law's birthday is January 1st. We could buy Maine shrimp. Um, wholesale, so you had to shell it yourself because you get it half priced if you do your own labor. And you put it in little baggies, and that was good, you know, good eating all through the winter. That's gone. That was a $14 million industry. Um, the good news is you can still get Maine shrimp. The bad news is you have to go to Newfoundland to get it um, because the oceans are that much warmer. Um, and, you know, we can just see what would happen at this. Go and, you know, $14 million industry is not. Is, it's small for some states, but it's not small for a state like Maine. And, and we know how much of legacy, you can th can't think of any kind of like typical Maine industry, whether it be lobstering or winter recreations like Titcomb or um, ice fishing, derbies, whatever it might be, snowmobiling, uh, blueberry harvests, all that stuff is threatened by a gradually increasing uh, temperature. As I was just about to say though, with um, even though Maine has this small, tiny little fraction of the U.S. carbon emissions, we're also blessed with a relatively re renewable heavy uh, grid. Um, so that with, uh, and there's a number of reasons why we can actually, this will make a tremendous effect for the lives of folks in Maine and for the industry and the, and the community leaders in Maine. If you were thinking about a future where um, we're putting a price on carbon and then giving that money back to folks so that they can transition to a renewables heavy future. Maine will be already at a huge advantage over other states that um, that are still burdened with a coal infrastructure that they're phasing out. We know um, on top of that, Maine can do more than any other state politically to bring this to into, into possibility because we're the only state with both of our senators on what's called the Bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus.
It's a group of seven uh, Republicans, um, in which Susan Collins is one of those, and then seven, uh, sorry, six Democrats plus Angus King, who caucuses with the Democrats. Um, and we know that there's bipartisan motion in this direction. So this, um, there's some camaraderie and there's some uh, rare uh, bipartisan support for a policy like this. And, on t and um, when we think about the future that we all want Maine to, to, to see, where we're kind of doing, we're being active to try to retain some of the legacy things we have where, so that we don't lose lobstering and winter sports the way we lost to Maine shrimp. Um, but we're also kind of making sure that communities, uh, there's some wealth that's being returned to those communities. Um, this carbon fee and dividend policy has been studied and is the document signed by more economists than any other document, of three, over 3,600 economists. 26 of them, I believe, are at Maine universities, including Unimaine uh, System, Colby Kate Pates Bowden, University of Southern Maine. They've all signed this document, which is the most signed document by any group of economists, saying that this is the most effective and equitable way to get our handle on the, the problem that climate change will be we'll be implementing it as we go forward here. So I'm sorry about the slideshow not working. I swear it was working when I before the, the computer went to sleep. I'll try it again, perhaps, uh, while we're talking. But it, it, I kind of went through a lot just now. But it, it, does anybody need me to back up or, or, or address any questions? I'd, I'd love to take questions, if possible. Peter, can yeah. you give us a verbal explanation of what the MIT uh, thing works? How the inverse one goes down and another goes up? Yeah, and that's what that's what you were able to see. Oh, uh -oh. It, it teased me. I turned it back open. Ah. Um, so the MIT model does uh, does the following, and I might just turn this thing around just so you can probably see it from here. Um, MIT's model. Uh, Basically, they, in 2014-15, they had another model, which was basically how to calibrate what different regions of the world needed to keep their carbon emissions in order to avert catastrophe, or to keep us below what the governing body of scientists say is 2 degrees, or 1.5 would be preferable, but 2 degrees centigrade, of, of warming above pre-industrial levels. Right now, we're already at about 1.3, so we're, that's why we're seeing some of the, you know, half, why California's on fire. Um, but the uh, but the model that is new that came out about I guess it was fall or winter of 2019-20 um, is much more policy based. You can actually put in po different policy ideas, and it's amazing how much pushback because everybody comes to this problem with like this idea of what we'd like to see, and the model which is which is great shows all of these different. Um, Nope, still not working. Uh, it shows all these different uh, policies. So, for instance, if I were to plant a trillion trees, we can see that uh, this model will show that between now and the end of the century, 2100, we're expected, if business as usual, just case, if the world just stays on the path we're on, we'll see 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit of warming, which is catastrophic. Um, if we plant a trillion trees, then it kind of goes down from 3.6 to 3.5. It's like barely makes a nudge. If you were to highly incentivize renewables, this is on a global scale, making your renewables cheaper either with tax incentives or anything like this, you can slide, see that slider move over. And um, that would, you know, it brings us down from 3.6 to 3.4. So all of these things um, you know, not to depress you right over your, your eggs and coffee in the morning, but they do a lot less than you might think. And a lot of that is because of the, the fundamentals of the economics of it. You can see when you highly incentivize renewables that for a while you see this green light go up. I'm going to try this one more time because this is really snazzy. I promise you it's worth it. Um, the, uh, the, uh, it's actually, the, the, the problems are such that... All right, I'm doing things in different orders now to see if this works, Dennis. Nope. Don't know. So I'm going to just turn this around because you might be able to see some of this. I'm not sure if anyone can see this, but this is the temperature on this side. This is the expected temperature increases as we go up from here. 
And this is where our energy is coming from. So all these different lines mean different energy sources, whether it be coal, oil, natural gas. And if you're interested, I'll be happy to sit at a table and walk you through it because I'll, I'll be around. I drove all the way up from Portland, so of course I'm just, I'll stick around. Um, but if, if I were to do something like, for instance, slide the A4 station knob all the way over, it makes a small difference. The renewables knob, if I do that, you can see, perhaps you can see if you've got good eyesight, this green line went up, but the coal line went down mid-century. Mid the problem is, is that what happens when everyone, if we're making it artificially incentivizing renewables, everybody moves away from coal, the dirtiest, but also the most plentiful of fossil fuels on, on the planet. What happens to the price of coal when everybody moves to renewables? It goes down. What happens then? Everybody wants to start to want to buy coal again because it's now the markets absorb that artificial mechanism. So the model shows we know need to not only disincentivize, or sorry, we need to not only incentivize good stuff, the carbon neutral stuff that's out there and coming more, you know, technologically coming along very fast, but we also need to disincentivize the bad stuff. And the one thing that does that economy wide, but also protects the poor and middle class is a, a carbon pricing mechanism, a carbon fee and dividend. And the one thing I didn't mention, this is probably a big thing to forget, sorry if I'm thrown off by the fact that I don't have the slides, is the fact that if you actually study this, and we're seeing this when it's been implemented in places like Canada, is that it actually is a, no one gets enormously rich, but there's an enormous benefit to the low and middle income folks um, across Canada, almost without exception. Because most of that carbon footprint is coming from folks, well, I don't know, about the folks in this room, but I don't have a private Learjet that's driving, you know, flying me from Bermuda to my condo in, Ta you know, in, in, in the ski in Canadian Al Alps or, or Canadian Rockies that has uh, that has outdoor heated swimming pool in January. But those there are folks out there with an enormous carbon footprint, and they're the ones who are going to be paying the most into this pile of money that's going to be divided evenly amongst all of us, if that makes sense. Which is why, if you're below 60% income level, you're making bank. And if you're between the 60 and 80 percent, you're roughly breaking even. It's the top 10, 20 percent um, who have the highest carbon footprint are the ones that will actually be generating most of that income. And of course, they're the ones that have, have the most ability to change their lifestyle or to decarbonize their lifestyle by doing the things, you know, that by, by changing what kind of vehicle they, they, they buy or insulating their house or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? Okay, more questions? Yes. So the aspect of all of this is that it's gonna be driving up fuel prices so that we'll drive less or um, convert our vehicles into electric vehicles. So, so I did a study in which I said, all right, suppose we take all the fuel that we're using to power um, automobiles right now, and it comes to roughly 11 million gallons of gasoline a day. Well, if that compares to that same type of energy that is produced from, say, Hoover Dam, it would take a thousand Hoover Dams to equal that amount of energy. So if we're looking at replacing 1% of the cars that are out there on the road to electric vehicles, we would need 10 Hoover Dams to do it. Right. We're not gonna have 10 Hoover Dams. Plus the aspect is, if I'm gonna drive a car across the country, I want to be able to stop every 20 miles, if possible, to be able to refuel my vehicle. Now, we are making great progress when it comes to lithium batteries and uh, being able to charge up those batteries. It looks like now, within the next year, we'll be able to do that in five to seven minutes um, after a stop, and you'll get a full charge that'll take you 320 miles. So that part of it's becoming more possible to do. Yep. Right? But I still don't see where all the copper is going to come from to put in all the energy that we have to have mm -hmm. every 20 miles for a refuel station and where that power is going to come from to be able to supply that. Yeah. The only link that we still have is that of of gasoline that goes out to all those individual stations. So the only course that we have is to take that gasoline, convert it directly over through an inverter, um, through a generator, and then through an inverter, then into your car, produce electricity at the spot. 
So how are you, how is... Right, that defeats the purpose, doesn't it? plan yeah. of getting to that point where electric vehicles are going to be viable without just, um, how are we going to put up um, um, generator stations every 20 miles across the United States? Right. So the, you're, these are excellent points, and one of the things that's nice about this policy is that it doesn't try, it does not, nothing's picking winners and losers here. And you're, you're talking about a very kind of technical um, limitation that we're going to run up against with the, the, the current generation of lithium-ion batteries and how that works. But I think we could also think about this as being a transition from then to perhaps hydrogen or some other means of actually storing that power um, you know, talk to uh, Joy Energy, which is one of the, the organizations that's endorsed this, is actually talking about, you know, the old hydrolysis uh, chemistry class where you run an electrical current through water and you separate the hydrogen from the oxygen atoms and to get, like, to create hydrogen, uh, which is tr tremendously uh, potent source of, of energy that you can kind of keep. For like hydrogen cell cars, that may be the, the direction we go in after a while, or different means of, of selling this. But the, the problem is, is that yes, they're going to be anticipated problem. Well, anticipated uh, <coughs> breakthroughs and thresholds that we're going to have to accomplish. That's and we don't. And basically, I you know, I, and I don't know to get enough to get bogged down in the technical part of it. But I know that the government is not great at coming up with winners and losers and picking that. What we want is basically to unleash the, um, b basically the, 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 the capacity for innovation from, from, from free industry. And, you know, I was talking to somebody from a, a, a large fossil fuel industry, and I was asking them, trying to pick the point, because the way this policy works is you start off at uh, 15 bucks on a, on, a, on a ton of CO2 and it gradually increases by 10 bucks per year it does you that money returns back and they were and I was saying at what cost do you start changing the modes of business do you stop try you know tackling the the next spot to to, to extract oil and he says you're asking the wrong questions it's as soon as we see a persistent and um, predictable policy coming out of Washington we will go the same direction that we did as we did in Europe and Canada and all these other places. So, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry about the, the AV problems. And on behalf of uh, Farmington Rotary, I want oh. to present to you this uh, recognition of service. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I got a mug. Thank you all very much. I'm happy to sit down and answer questions afterwards.